and that's the one. I'll take down my little sticky right in the middle of my monitor to tell me to record the thing because well good well let me let me let me get us underway with a word of prayer and we'll, we'll talk about congregational vitality let's pray well god we give you thanks for the beauty of this day and the opportunity to gather uh, a chance to hear your word to give you praise and to ponder uh, the life of the church uh, in particular we ponder the Matthew 25 initiative of our denomination and how Westminster might fulfill uh, its calling to the uh, Matthew 25 church. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. There's another one coming on. So last Sunday, I did a little bit of an intro to Matthew 25 um, as, a, as a text because we didn't want to you know, have everybody have to talk about that. But a number of years ago, the Presbyterian Church USA established this Matthew 25 initiative, invited congregations to become a part of it. Um, we were the 50th 5-0 congregation out of, I don't know, there are about nine, roughly 9,000 Presbyterian churches in the country. So, so we were early in the group. I'm not sure there are I don't know that there are a thousand churches yet in on this, but I know there are several hundred. Um, and um, so we're, you know, kind of thought, we've talked about it in a few places and printed up stuff and bulletins, but we thought let's let's spend a little time exploring, exploring congregation of vitality. So, um, or exploring Matthew 25. So I'm going to hopefully, we'll see, share my screen. And I'll probably do this a couple of different ways. Can you all see my screen? Yes. Are you seeing one big slide or are you seeing a slide and a second slide with pointers? Yes, second slide with pointers and a big one. Uh, if you can go to the full screen, it would help. Let's see if I can choose display settings. There you go. There you go. I'm, you know, I'm reasonably technologically capable, but still learning some of these things. Good. So, um, that's on the slide of what there's one. Okay, so building con congregational vitality is, is one of, of three, um, if you will, emphases or, or principles of this, of this uh, Matthew 25 uh, initiative. And um, here's, here's my question. You know, it's why would the Presbyterian Church USA chosen as sort of a national denominational uh, uh, initiative building congregational vitality alongside dismantling structural racism and eradicating systemic poverty um, it, to me my first thought was it feels like a very different kind of emphasis um, and and just it was it was a you know kind of a um, and my first thought was, well, they, they've got a couple pretty big, humongous, giant things up there, racism and poverty. And so let's put something that, you know, any church can connect with. I was actually a little cynical when I first, when I first heard it. But, but, but why, why do you think the PCUSA would have chosen um, this as a, and I can't see everybody, so you'll just have to shout. This is Judas without. Uh -uh. Place to start. You can't do the others without having vitality in your congregation. Right. Okay. Life yeah. <clears throat> it's foundational as far as I as far as I see. It's where it's like just what Gabrielle said, it's it's where it starts. It's because we are a church and believers in Christ and we worship together, study together, learn together. 
that that vitality is what we need to be able to get the perspective to work in the other things. It's Christ's example. I don't know. Go ahead. Kind of being the pragmatist, um, I think if you look at the um, attendance and engagement in traditional congregations, which I think in many areas is waning, um, they may have felt that uh, helping to build local congregations was the first step, you know, unnecessary step. Mm -hmm. Just being pragmatist here. No, no, that's that because that's exactly where I, I sort of ended up, Nancy, after I sort of stepped out of my sort of cynical thinking about, about so, this. So, Go ahead, so many Ernest. congregations uh, have hunkered down in sort of a survivalist uh, mode. And I think this suggests there's a different way to approach the congregation. Now, it's not just the survival of the congregation, which so many of our congregations seem to be locked into, but we, in a sense, we have to move beyond that and become vital, <laughs> which we do by reaching out, not reaching in. I would, it occurred to me when I was listening to the Celebrate Recovery discussion uh, this morning in service that you need a essentially a vibrant, a, a vital congregation in order to support that thing. Uh, that if you don't have the underlying, I don't know, mass of, of uh, people who are willing to, to believe and, and support that kind of thing, then it doesn't happen. So if, if that, if, if Celebrate Recovery, for example, is a, an important part of the mission, then you need the congregation underneath it to uh, to support it. And I do think it's one of those things where the um, you know it's, it's sort of the the sort of circular nature of of mission and ministry that that it may actually be that kind that's an example of a, of a ministry that could actually bring a level of vitality to. Um, the congregation or an increased level of, of vitality. Um, I think vitality also speaks to engagement. You know, it's not just the number of people in the pews, but it's rather, it's more than that. It's the things that they do, all the things that, um, uh, was it uh, Jenny who uh, listed, or, or Anne who listed off to, in today's service about all the things that we're doing in the community? So there, there's a vitality by being engaged and uh, the membership being, um, taking time to really show up and do action. You guys are, you guys are covering all my slides, so I'm, I'm, gonna, <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna jump ahead to because do I, you know, I think there is a, there's a as, as Nancy sort of said that, you know, with, without a congregation, there aren't Christians to work on the other issues, um, and, you know, and without vitality, you, you end up not having congregations. So here's, it's just, you know, I think this is one of the things, that, and Nancy, you, you alluded to it, that, that That's Christian right. share U.S. population declining everywhere, age, demography. Uh, adults who do not identify with any organized religion is, is growing. Um, church is not at the center of you know American culture the way the way it once was. Um, I don't know if you're able to read all this, but the the blue represents um, just um, well. The, this is this is a ten year span. This is from Pew, um, 2009 to 2019. So a ten year span over the last just you know 12 years. But the blue represents 09 and the orange represents the you know current or recent current and the, and the gray represents the percentage of change. And Christians as a percent of the population dropped from 77% to 65% or at least those who proclaim that's their affiliation and 12% decrease just 10 years. Um, you know, 51% Protestant, 
dropped to 43%, a, um, an 8% change. Um, and you can see the unaffiliated rising from 17% to 26%. You claim no religious affiliation. And, you know, we're, we're yeah. looking at this in, in Princeton Seminary because the change in, in our seminary population is, is really um, radically affecting the life of the seminary. Um, and the number of applicants, the number of students. Uh, when I was at Princeton, about 48% of the student body were Presbyterians, the Presbyterian seminary. This year, only 10% of the student body are Presbyterians at a Presbyterian seminary. Don? Yeah, go ahead. Don? So what is the opposite of Protestant in this context? What is the opposite of Protestant? Well, it would be Catholic and Orthodox. We were, we were okay. looking at just sort of the change in Protestants sort of the okay. mainline um, traditions. It's another, those who identify as religiously unaffiliated. The Lenin was 40%, Gen X 25%, Baby Boom was 17%, and Simon 10%. And while it may not seem monumental, the difference, you know, from one generation to the next, the, the, the shift. I remember one, somebody once saying to me that 25% um, of my generation, and I'm a boomer, um, you know, were continuing to be actively engaged in congregations, you know, and and 25%, only 25% of my kids' generation. So you go from 25% in one generation to 25% in the next generation, you see you know, really radical, um, you know, kind of defined uh, in, in the life of the church. And, and I think you're right. One of the reasons are, you know, not just, oh, we need to throw church people a bone. So we'll say, you know, church vitality. Maybe we could, we could think about that. Um, the... The Presbyterian Church USA is numbers a whole lot of congregations that um, are not quite like what Ann Hatfield described in the sermon this morning, vibrant and vital. And here's, here's the language from the PCUSA in Matthew 25. To some extent, many local churches find themselves spiritually exhausted, financially fragile, structurally unsound. Sometimes congregational life is discouraging, both for pastors, and pastors may be lay pastors, may not even be, you know, uh, seminary trained. Pastors and other church leaders who see apathy in their members, and for members who see the numbers in the pews declining. And so this is, this is sort of the backdrop of, of why the Presbyterian Mission Agency, which is the group, the, the dominant portion of our denomination, who who put this Matthew 25 um, program together. And um, this is the you know, reasoning for uh, making a commitment to help people turn things around. And, and for the church, I mean, you know, we've had a significant focus on, on racism uh, and uh, systemic uh, structural racism over the last couple of years and see that as a really, really dominant um, concern uh, focus for the church. Uh, in some ways, we're we're privileged um, as a congregation to be able to do that because we're 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 not um, as um, if you will we're not, we're, we're not on life support. Um, we don't feel like we're um, you know, we're we're wondering if we're going to make it. Or are we going to be able to get a pastor? Are we going to be able to? Pay our pastor, are we going to be able to keep the doors open? Are there going to be enough people for us to elect an officer or two? Uh, so uh, clearly, congregational vitality is, is um, a huge piece of, of this initiative um, for, for Presbyterians. So I think it, it's just it's important to sort of remember uh, our context and, and you know why this is this is so essential and why you know, at first glance when you say that's poverty racism oh and then congregational life or something you know, this is it's 
it's it's in great need of um, support and encouragement, particularly in this country and mainline denominations. Ernie, you look right. Yeah, go. Uh, I just, you know, what the information you're providing raises the question in my mind of what, well, put possibly, how can a church like ours that is vital help some of these you know, the half of the denomination that's below 100 members and so on to gain some measure of vitality in whatever corner of God's kingdom they're working. You know, is there, should we be thinking about ways to read this being a vital congregation more widely? Can we help others gain some vitality in their congregation? Yeah, and I, a little later, we'll, we'll you know, raise a couple of places where I think we've, we've tried, you know, attempted to do that. But I think that's one of the, one of the things, and, and Presbyterians, you know, we're, you know, we're gathered together in Presbyterians, and there are ways in which, you know, for a long time, um, larger, uh, more financially sound congregations have equipped and, and enabled you know, a lot of the business of presbytery to go on, but I think you're right. There's there may be uh, a need for new um, for new think and and how we you know how we support and encourage uh, other congregations. One of the other interesting pieces of that, though, for me is is you know there are places in our presbytery where you can draw a line of uh, you know. A few miles long and go through four Presbyterian churches, and and they go back to the day when that was you know you only wanted to take your horse and buggy so far. Uh, and and one of the one of the challenges for us is is how many how many dwindling congregations do we have at every tiny crossroad across the you know across the heartland that that can no longer thrive can no longer afford anything but but. You know the suggestion that might they join forces um, is is anathema because you know Aunt Gertrude gave the stained glass and you know Uncle Bob you know is buried in the churchyard and you know and uh, and and yet you know it clearly isn't you know pioneer days where every denomination needed to plant a church on the four corners of the main street of of the teeny little town uh, and. And, that, and those are challenging, you know, things both in, you know, internal to the denomination and interdenominational. Are there ways in which uniting uh, in, in ministries uh, makes us more efficient and more effective? But those are challenging uh, concerns for for a lot of mainline churches who are seeing, you know, the debt kind of decline. Uh, well, let me let me just. So, so what does what does congregational vitality mean to you? I mean, just give me a give me a phrase or two. What what what's that concept mean? And if nobody has anything, I'll I'll show you what the denomination says. Gabrielle has something. Gabrielle. I, I think it's important not to be smug. We, we're not hearing you. Um, can you hear me now? Yeah. <laughs> it's important not to be smug. It's a continual learning process, growing, growing in your faith, growing in Christ, getting to know what it is to be a Christian. It may be a, a, a life, life task, really. And that's just about the individual in a, in a vital congregation, but mm -hmm. we're all, that's what it's about. We are individuals banding together. I think of local mission work. But again? Repeat yourself. Local mission work, working in the community. Yeah. Hands-on engagement in your own 
Right, uh, jumping off of what Gabrielle was saying, I'm thinking it's about humility and um, um, servantship, servant leadership. Let me show you what the what they have written up as kind of a preliminary about congregational vitality. You might think vitality of the congregational worshiping community is based on the number of members, scope of program, size of financial gifts, or some other stats. Not not so, at least not entirely. You know, I don't, I don't, I'm I'm one who will always say, well, don't tell me it's never about the numbers because you know that. that but the community's vitality is primarily its spiritual strength and its capacity for purposeful mission. Congregational vitality is evident in a worship community when its structural systems, finances, discipleship practices are aligned in such a way. Community is actively engaged in the mission of God in their local community and the world. They are powerfully focused on growing as disciples in the way of Jesus Christ. Faith comes alive when we boldly engage God's mission and share the hope we have in Christ. And, and here's how they said, they, they said, well, and here's, here's a way to assess vitality of your congregation. There were seven marks, if you will, of, of vitality. Um, and this, again, is still part of the Matthew 25 uh, resources from our denomination. And this is exactly what you were saying, Gabrielle. Commitment to foreign disciples over every member's lifetime. That leads to personal transformation, people put on the heart of Christ, and to social transformation as people joyfully go forth into the community and tackle the issues facing today's culture. Number two, embracing the call to evangelism. We show forth the love of Christ by our actions and our lives, even more than by our words. Our relationships are genuine and caring. People know we are Christians by our love. Uh, I noticed that evangelism is, is um, you know, show forth the love of Christ. It's not only, you know, quoting scripture to people and, you know, powerful messages of call to repentance, which are important, um, but, but doing so in such a way with love and genuineness and caring that, that the people are drawn to it. I mean, some people need a two by four upside the head, but most people don't respond very favorably to that. And, and you know, for some evangelism is, you know, like a frontal assault. Uh, and, and, you know, I think that, you know, seeing evangelism as sharing the love of Christ in such a genuine and caring way that people wonder what in the world is up with these people. It's, it's, you know. This, this third one, I think, is huge, and I think Paul, you know, alluded to it, and, and it, it's this outward focus. I mean, your congregation is only focused in if it's, you know, if it's, it's, it's only got itself in mind and, and sees, you know, this is our, our little, um, you know, safe haven from the world. Uh, it, it, and, and nothing will change, and we won't change, and nobody can come in and we say we'd love to have new members, but only if you look, act, think, dress, sing like us. Um, so a church is not a place to escape from the world, rather a gateway to our community through the hands, feet, heart, mouth of Jesus Christ for people who are suffering or marginalized. Number four, empowering every member to discover their individual calling, gifts God has given them so they can go forth and serve. This is one of those things where, where it's, um, you know, the invitation to uh, everybody. Everybody's got a place. You know, all God's chilling got a song. It's a <laughs> same kind of, kind of idea. Uh, I love five because, you know, worship is just so central to what I do and it's central to who I am and where I connect with God. Um, I continue to find, you know, it's where my heart gets touched. Uh, my emotional incontinence only increases as I age and where it shows up, it hit me again today, just praying 
for Brooke Scott uh, in the prayer. I had to pause for a moment. Um, and uh, so spirit-inspired worship that challenges, teaches, transforms, convicts, and energizes us. So when we are sent out, we've experienced the wonder of God our change for the better from when we arrive. And I, and I, I love that. Language. Caring relationships, modeled on God's love, open our doors, hearts to all people. CR is clearly one of those places where we, we are convicted about you know, making space and resources for everyone. Build relationships that are modeled God's love, genuine reconciliation, peace. And then, I, you know, number seven was really, you know, it, it struck me, um, you might not always think about this, with congregations with healthy systems. Um, if you don't have healthy systems, you, you can have difficulty being a vital congregation. Um, it's, it's where our mission focuses are clear. We know what we're about. Uh, there's fiscal responsibility and accountability. Uh, we got president of our trustees on here and I need to tell you how seriously she takes fiscal responsibility and accountability because she knows, you know, without a healthy system with about the kind of transparency we need and accountability, um, you know, we will not function well. Uh, we won't know what we've got. We won't know what we need. Thoughtful decision-making structures um, that leaders lead and pastors don't make every single decision in some back room by themselves or with their two favorite cronies. Um, and we use the staff enjoy a sustainable balance of work and rest time. Any, any thoughts about those, those seven? I'll go back again as quickly as I can. Forming disciples, call to evangelism, outward focus, empowering every member to discover their individual calling, spirit inspired worship, caring relationships, and congregations have healthy systems. Anything jump at you or really ring a bell for you in terms of? I volunteer at the thrift shop and um, six jumped out at me this time just because of some of the experiences that we've had there over the years where people say they like to come because we are, quote, nice to them <laughs> and we make things look nice. Uh, we recently had an, 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 an occurrence where one customer paid for another customer's goods because they didn't have the money with them. And one of the other customers decided that they should stop and just have a prayer right then and there. And I don't think that would happen in Strawbridges, but it happened with joy at the thrift shop. So it's, it's, just, it's a, for me, that's, a, that's one that I can come up with examples right away of, of welcoming everybody. I, I was struck uh, by number seven, partly because of my current involvement uh, in, in the pastor nominating committee, um, where I think our practice of involving, trying to involve people from all parts of the congregation and doing it in a very open, I mean, it's, I'm amazed at how candid we can be with each other, which I think is a very indicative of a healthy working um, system within the church. So um, I, I'm very happy to see this on the denominational list because I think that's a very perceptive of a way of describing congregational vitality. The timing couldn't have been better. <laughs> All like Carolyn that I like, yeah, it really, and, and I think, you know, the idea that, that you know, a healthy system, you know, a healthy body enables you to be a more vital participant in life and congregational systems can be, you know, a real challenge. I was with, uh, the whole folks the other day, Princeton Seminary Board of Trustees, one of the pastors was talking about stuff struggling with in their system. And he says, you know, we pastors are want to say, you know, church would be great if it went for church people. 
and uh, you know, and congregations would likely say, and church would be great if it weren't for pastors messing with us. But healthy <laughs> systems um, are are so critical, uh, and it's where we where we learn internally how to be about you know reconciliation and you know genuine caring, um, empowering other people's gifts, and we don't do that well. Um, you know, congregations struggle to, you know, raise up, you know, leadership, um, you know, people feel, you know, disenchanted or disconnected or like, well, I don't care. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to show up. Um, but those are, they're great. Great. Uh, I, I really like, you know, it's this um, outward focus to me is, is one that I, that I love that, that you know, we really as a church are not, um, Somebody said that church is the only organization whose primary focus is its non-members. You know, I, I always said it to oh, church, churches, we're supposed to take care of all the churches where we come and we take care of all our own people and you come and be like us and be like us and, you know, um, and, and you know, to be the only organization in the world that's, that, who's, only, who's really only focus is, is its non-members. So I'm, I'm curious, let me, let me put up this slide and then I'll stop share. So go ahead, Betsy. I was just going to say every one of these is wonderful. Um, it, you know, you, it's hard to say what church means to you or why you're there or whatever. And I think this is a really good, um, it's really good. Um, and the caring relationships, of course, is absolutely huge. But I also have that thing about that spirit inspired worship, because that's the one thing I've missed so much in person, not not the zoom thing, the zoom thing's been outstanding, don't get me wrong, the live streaming has kept me connected and I'm so happy about that. But that being in that being in that sanctuary, you know, being with other folks that believe the same way I do that to me that gives me that gives me what I want for the rest of the week, for the rest of, you know, the next couple of weeks, for the meetings I go to, for everything I do. It influences all of my relationships. And I'm just so happy to have been there today and last week. So I really feel the same way you do with that inspired worship, um, meeting people firsthand is important to me. So I'm, I'm curious because my guess is most of us have had some experience of congregational vitality prior to our connection at Westminster. You know, um, so I'm gonna, and I'm gonna stop sharing for a little bit just so we can see more faces. I'm gonna ask you what, you know, in your history in congregational life, where have you seen, you know, vitality uh, in, in your own church experiences, you know, what did it look like? What what made it happen? What what um, uh, why does it even come to mind? So I'm going to stop sharing. Go to the full screen so I could see faces and hands. But I'm, I'm guessing Westminster is not the only vital congregational ministry that you people have participated in. Yeah, Carolyn or Paul ago I was attending a Presbyterian church in Delaware County and we as a small group got together and we studied what we call the gifts of the spirit and it was quite an interesting study we talked about to each other about things strengths that we saw and then we thought individually about things that we recognized in ourselves and then we were challenged to use those gifts in the community. And it really did improve the vitality of the church. People reached out and got involved in committees and got involved in more studies, created new small groups. It was quite interesting. That's good. Others instances, part of this is because I think we, we forget that congregational vitality is, it, it, I love all seven of those points, but, but it's, it's application and implementation and sort of effect. It really is localized and that, you know, you know, we're not an urban congregation. So 
you know, I mean, we could have a soup kitchen, but, you know, there'd be nobody to come, <laughs> you know. Uh, I mean, if we had a gourmet breakfast bar, it, that might, you know, fly in this section of Chester County. But I'm curious what you have seen in other places that you would say would be, you know, congregational vitality where, where the church came, you know, alive in a particular way or for a particular reason. Yeah, Judy. Yeah, you're still muted. Still muted. <laughs> no. Still me. When you when you if you figure out you're unmuted, like hold hold this. Can the, can, the host, can the host unmute her? I can't. I can ask oh. her to unmute. Both can out. It's one of the failures. Yeah. Am I unmuted? There you go. You're on. Okay. Um, in my previous congregation, there was a, a, a nucleus of people that were interested in trying new um, tasks uh, to go into the community, care and connections, um, having lunch for the homeless, that sort of thing but it didn't seem like it was long lived. Um, I wanna go back to the question before this section that says, which one of these uh, seven points are you uh, mm -hmm. kind of drawn yes. to? Right. And as the new kid on the block, I hope in a couple of weeks at Westminster, um, I'm excited about seeing all those things because I see a little bit of everything that I would like to get involved in or be a part of in all those areas. So I see it as I made the right choice and I just have to wait to get involved. <laughs> Thanks, Judy. Yeah, when you, when, you know, and, and they put those like, here are, here are seven sort of assessment points for congregations to look at in terms of vitality. And, I, and it's like, we're, we are not done, but, but, there's a there's a richness to our life, you know, reflecting those things. Yeah, Ernie. Oh, uh, in our previous congregation, um, twice uh, in the time we were there, we sponsored a refugee family. Uh, one first from Vietnam, and later from the Bosnian War, and both of those provide an opportunity for many people in the congregation to get involved, uh, helping them personally or helping arrange housing or all the many, many tasks that are involved in trying to help a new family get settled uh, in the United States. So that, that was, I think, good examples of vitality in that congregation. Others. I for a while um, in California, I was um, going to attending a Unitarian church, and um, they are very involved politic politically and socially. But there was so much anger behind it. They were mad about this, and they were mad about that. And it really. Um, well, drove me away from that church. And I don't know if that's true of Unitarians everywhere, just, you know, where I was. But anyway, uh, what I like about um, the seven points is that it all along the way, and I think this is true in Westminster, um, is that you, you want to outreach and do outreach with love and compassion. And that's huge. And it's huge for people like me that are not Christian, that um, get inspiration. Yeah, I see you looking. <laughs> I'm coming out of the closet, okay. Um, <laughs> but, but welcome, I feel welcome. And um, so I think when we're talking about losing so many people, younger generations more and more and more, um, that's, that's really an important thing. You know, you, I have heard today, people that don't look like me, people who don't think like me, people that, you know, we, we want to reach them, we want to touch them, we want to welcome them. 
And I congratulate the church on, on all of that. I think it's unusual. Thanks, Katie. Yeah, I, I, you know, the privilege for congregations to, um, to have people, you know, who, who aren't all in the very same place because the, the reality is none of us knows all truth. And, and early on, uh, I don't even remember who, who it was that used the word humility, but what you described, I mean, you can be you know, angry about injustice or um, things that are going wrong in places, but, but with humility, you know, your, your approach and your attitude to others um, can be, you know, generous in such a way that, that it's, it's, it's so much more welcoming. And I think, I think you're, you're describing, you know, one of the, one of the goals uh, of, of this emphasis and certainly one of the goals of, of Christians is, is not to be so, you know, closed or mean spirited that, that the very people you'd love to be in community with don't feel like they have a place. The, the one yeah, thing that I didn't see in that list explicitly that's been important to me is um, youth programs, focus on families, uh, churches that are inviting, uh, provi providing um, um, services for the, the kids. From afar, we have not yet been to the sanctuary. From afar, um, I don't see the children. That's why the service where you uh, granted the... Uh, Confirmation, confirmation. Was, was, was so nice, it was so nice to see that number of, of young, young adults making that commitment and the commitment of the church returned to them. So I would add one, one bullet somehow to, to make sure the, 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 the vitality of the church uh, enhances its vitality by very strong youth programs. And I think, I think that the folks would say that the very first bullet, which is the lifelong you know, discipleship and transformational nature is, is where they would house that because, because once you start picking one group, then it's said, well, what about, you know, seniors and what about <laughs> empty nesters and what about, you know, widows and widowers and, you know, what about the tweeners and the, the, you know, the, the, the dinks, the, you know, the dual income, no kids and the, and the nursery and, you know, I mean, it, and so I think, but, but it's clear that, you know, and it's why confirmation, um, I, you know, Sunday school confirmation youth ministry are so, are so critical and in vital congregations, um, you know, uh, and, and a lot of young people um, find their faith in those years. I mean, not everybody does. They may have also wanted to ab avoid um, the 26 member church whose average age is 92 <laughs> and hasn't seen a teenager except at Christmas when somebody visits grandma to feel like they're not, you know, yeah. vital because they don't have a youth ministry. I mean, I, you know, when I first got to my church in Annapolis, Christ Our Anchor, it's a new church development. We would have a children's time and for a number of years, one kid came forward <laughs> until he got just so rambunctious and so old and so middle schoolish that I just said, Jacob, please, please don't. Come. <laughs> we had to kind of, but, it, and eventually it, it, it became robust with, with children, but it's a, but I, I your point is very appropriate and, and perhaps vitality in whatever niche you're in. Um, is important. I, I served a church in seminary up in Rockland County, New York, up near the Tappan Zee Bridge, about 75 miles north of Princeton. And the pastor's wife was doing her master's in, um, I don't even know what it was called at that point, but, but basically, you know, special education, working with folks with mental development issues. And Ultimately, the congregation ended up doing a confirmation class for adults with mental deficiencies. Back then, it was mental retardation, EMR, EMR trainable or educable. And, and they came to worship. Mm -hmm. And it was not easy for some of the folks in the congregation, but it became mm. 
such a life-giving ministry. And they would express themselves periodically in worship. And there were members of the congregation who became their shepherds and sat with them and held their hands. And they would come on a bus and there'd be like 15 to 20 of them who would come and worship. It was not a big church. And, and the life they brought to that church. Um, I mean, you know, you think, oh, the life we're going to give them, we're going to give them a place that the life they brought to that kind of was mm-hmm. amazing. And, and in that church, it was the, the, the niche that they had found that, that, um, and that's not everybody's niche, but it was, it was amazing to see how, um, vital that, that was. Yeah. Larry, Nancy. Um, I don't know if it touches on any of those topics, but it, it, kind of swings back to the anecdote you just included and also what Judy said, Um, but there've been a number of opportunities that have been available because we had a church community. Um, I think working with other congregations within the community is very critical to the vitality of all of us. I mean, I was able to work with Bridge of Hope. We worked with another church, the people on our committee, you know, Sometimes those things work well, sometimes they don't, but you don't know until you put your toe in that pond. Um, I think working on projects with Habitat or Good Works, um, especially if you have the opportunity to involve young people, which has become more and more difficult for litigious reasons, but um, I think those which can become cross-generational and definitely are cross-congregational and do not involve the... um, the differences which can divide us, but focus on something which we can work on together. So I think working with other congregations of of all sizes can be very um, supportive of vitality. I think back to way, way back in, Larry and I both agreed, you know, we have not had close contact with another congregation for so long. We don't know what other congregations might be like, but way back when I was on Christian Ed Oh, what seems like eons ago when our children were in preschool, um, we did not have a big teenage population in the church at that time. So a lot of them were going to first press for youth group. And oh, there was a lot of concern because we didn't have this vitality. Wait a second, they're going somewhere. Does it matter if they're under our roof or they're under somebody else's roof? They're going somewhere. They are gathering with people who have a common purpose and, you know, what are they going to not get at first press that they might get at Westminster? Because then it was around the corner. The kids went to school together. And I think particularly when you're working, if you're talking about young people, critical mass is very important. If you do not have a critical mass of young people, they will go someplace else where there's a critical mass. You know, not many teenagers are going to stand alone. They will go where there's a group of teenagers. There are people who disagree with me, but that's my observation from spending 30 years working with 13 year olds. <laughs> I, I led a youth group with two junior high and one senior high and, and, yeah. and it was, and they were only there because their parents made them. And it was, it was, it was tough to, tough to do. Ernie, <laughs> Gabrielle, one of you, you got a hand I, up? Here we go. Since we have you, uh, Don here, could you, I'm curious, are there people going to seminary to be pastors with this, huge decline in interest in Christianity or whatever. What, what's, the, what's the temperature there at Princeton Seminary? I, I, there are, but they're fewer and further between. Um, I had lunch with three seminarians on Thursday and um, joyfully, two of the three are headed to the pastorate. Um, the other one is completely unclear. Uh, and I had classmates like that, but they were, they were the exception. Um, and, and some people are, are doing seminary training to, you know, consider working in community development or working for NGOs um, and, and, and want the theological background. Um, the one student next to me was, look, he wants to look for a small country church because that's what he grew up in. And his, you know, his father's pastor of a little country church in central Indiana. And uh, so he's, uh, I said, well, you're open to Eastern Pennsylvania? And he said, well, I might be. And I said, well, good, because they're, you know, they're, 
you know, I don't have to go drive very far to get to a small country church that, that could use a you know, well-educated, you know, pastor. And, uh, but the numbers are different, you know, it was, you know, more than 50% of my class went into pastoral ministry. And I'm guessing the numbers are well below 50% of seminary, you know, students. Uh, and, and it's a smaller number. And part of that is, is, you know, churches aren't sending, you know, you know, people to seminary, they're not, they're not asking their students, have you thought about this? Um, I mean, that was how I ended up, at least with the idea of being planted. Uh, ministry is perhaps in some people's minds, not seen as it once was, is just a prominent, you know, prestige there. <laughs> laudable, well, doctors, lawyers, ministers, like, you know, they, there are more jokes about all of them than, <laughs> you know, it, you know, where do they fit in society? But I, it's, it is a concern um, that the, um, and the fact that churches are closing um, is part of a struggle, but the fact that churches can't find pastors, can't find good pastors. Um, the other, you know, another piece of that is seminary debt. You know, if I got to go and, you know, come out of seminary with 80 to a hundred thousand dollars worth of debt by the time I finish my undergrad and graduate. And then, you know, it's, you know, if you do that, if you've got that amount of debt, but you're going to, you're going to start at a hundred grand a year and finish your career at half a million a year, I, you know, that's not a big deal. But if you're, you know, if your salary is going to be, you know, below the local teachers, um, you know, who can't live in the community, then it, it, it can be a challenge. So there's, there's a number of deterrents and we're trying to address some of that in, in seminary. Let me, let me grab, see if I can share my screen again and say, um, slide, can you see, you're seeing the other one, aren't you? Let me swap those. You see the big, big one, Congregational Vitality? Yes. Yeah. yeah, that was the last slide. Let me get to. So here, just, you know, what, what would you describe Westminster as a vital congregation? What are we doing to build vitality? What should we be thinking about in terms of vitality for the future? And, and I'll just say a couple of things, and then I'll invite you to, to share. But um, somebody said about other congregations, one of the things I loved, you know, when Westminster took over the Dilworth Town, church that was dying and needed to close they could no longer fund themselves we established a satellite campus there which became a training ground for a, a young pastor on our team and um we, we eventually closed that for a variety of reasons but when we closed it there was there was a preschool a very active preschool in that church and all the preschool equipment and all the resources and furniture and everything else and there was a Methodist church, not actually closer to the Dilworth Town Church than we were, um, who, whose, you know, sort of geographic circle um, overlapped with the neighborhood where most of these preschool kids went uh, or lived. And we basically gave the Methodist, now we gave the Methodist, like, you hear that? We gave the Methodists <laughs> an, an intact preschool probably about, you know, I don't know, forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 worth of equipment and an intact um, student body and an intact faculty and director and picked up lock, stock and barrel, the playground and everything. And that congregation was had been looking for ways to bring um, young families. And, and the, the next fall, they had an injection of, of young families and children who, who, because they came to the preschool and the kids found the place okay, was an easy walk through the door. Um, I loved the fact that this congregation was intentional about, about that. Um, and, and, you know, that's building congregational vitality in somebody else's shop, which like, this is, this is the work God you know, calls us to. I'll, I'll say one other and then Feel free if you, you've got some ideas. The, the Westchester food cupboard did not exist when I got here. And, and, and we didn't collect food. Um, and a, 
member of this congregation and some others, and I had nothing to do with this, was, were central in establishing that food cupboard. I mean, and Westminster continues, I believe, at least the last time I heard, gives more food to the food cupboard than all the other congregations in the area combined. And I love, it's one of the things I miss about people in the building because so many people just it became part of their routine um, to bring a bag with, you know, a couple cans of beans or a couple jars of spaghetti sauce or a couple boxes of pasta. Um, and, and, and that's that's a vital congregation uh, to watch that happen as people come in the doors. So other, other things that we're doing to build vitality, things we need to think about. I'm going to stop the share so I can. Yeah, Betsy. I think the rise against hunger is a huge thing. Uh, it was wonderful to me to see all the people in the church today doing it. I worked on Friday when there wasn't, we were sort of prepping stuff, but um, to see all those people and families, kids involved, everything else, that to me is really a hands-on, you know, uh, way to show how much we care about the world. And in doing so, we care about ourselves because we're in community doing it. And I think that was, that's a wonderful thing to do. And uh, I appreciate, I appreciate Angela's leadership in it because she certainly heads the whole deal and it's great. But a young family visiting the last uh, maybe five, six weeks that I've been in an email conversation with. And um, she said, is there something we could do to get involved in this? And I explained Rise Against Hunger. They signed up and, and, then, and then they may be bringing, um, she said, we have two rather active dogs, but they may be at the blessing of the animals. And, <laughs> you know, it's a young couple who are trying to find their way coming out of COVID into the life of the church, you know, and, and finding <clears throat> where you can be with people and talk to people and engage with people. Something beautiful. Other things, other ways that you... How you would describe Westminster is, is, is vital. Well, I, I think that um, when we have people from these organizations come and talk for five minutes at the pulpit or have videos to share or whatever, that that really um, gives everybody a feel that, wow, they're, you know, I'm, I'm maybe only involved with one or two things, but there's a lot going on. And, um, you know, it, it really feels vital. It is vital. I like the fact that we started this nerve to serve email uh, where we're publicizing what we're doing in the community and encouraging others to join. Uh, I think that's, that's, that shows that that shows what we're doing. Yeah, that's good. And for those who don't know, we have a weekly email that comes out and it's, you know, new, you know, basically news and what's going on in the electric church usually comes out Thursday, but there's another one that you can sign up for it comes out at uh, every couple of weeks and it's basically just and so the nerve to serve it's, it's all the outreach opportunities um, and sometimes it's you know feel like on sunday morning we could do announcements for like as ann said this morning for like 10 or 12 minutes you know uh and and we pastors uh, in case you don't know it get lobbied regularly uh, by people. <laughs> don please announce the uh whatever it is um but you're, you're right Ann, and it's a great uh, newsletter uh, and, and obviously not everybody is equipped or able to do all the same stuff which I think is another thing uh, for this congregation because of who we are we're able to provide a, a variety of things in some congregations it may just be one thing that they pour their heart and soul into um, but people rally around that, that effort for that ministry Yeah, I um, feel the same way about the variety. I think we're, we are such a big church and, and I've been a member for years and um, 
only recently retired. So now I'd really like to get more involved and, and there is a choice and that makes it good. Um, but for a long time, I've had a struggle with the bigness. I'm very old and actually a veteran of Old Elderstown Presbyterian Church and attended there and loved it. Yeah. And I love the warmth. I just love the people. Uh, we had house churches. We just congregated and we were so supportive. Uh, and I think, you know, I really want to get more involved now and in, in, in looking at the different varieties of places now that I had the time to get involved. So yeah. I'm, I'm grateful for that. That's great. Thank you, Linda. One of the challenges for a church like us is that our, our congregation covers a thousand square miles. Um, yeah. I mean, the bulk of it is within about a, you know, a seven, eight mile radius, but we have people in Honeybrook. We have people, we had a member from Mullica Hill for years. Hmm. Um, we um, had, you know, members in, in Drexel Hill, um, regular. And of course, now we found with streaming, we have members live near Pittsburgh and we actually have a member who's in Bon Air on the island of Bon Air who worships with us regularly. Um, so, you know, it's, it's different what you can and can't do, but, um, you know, one of the things we've found through Zoom and we, and we need to start thinking about is, are there some ways we can do, if you will, as Linda said, house church with mm -hmm. um, small groups? And it doesn't make any difference if you live in the same neighborhood. Um, if, if you could gather periodically, and it's one of the things I think we need to think about, you know, are there, and, and clearly, you know, some of our small groups uh, have found this a, a you know, one of the, if you will, the, the blessings that's come out of this pandemic is, is there are ways to stay connected. It's not the same by any means being face to face, but there, there are other opportunities. Um, I, I love the fact that I can say to my colleagues who I'm telling, please give names of potential pastor candidates to our BNC. I love being able to say this congregation is is so vital. I I I can't keep track. I mean, ever since I got here, people say, "Don, what was going on at your church on Wednesday?" I go, "I don't, I, I don't know." I was like, "Who knows?" But there were the parking lot was full of cars. I, you know, it's I could name a couple things. I know that, but it, and that's one of the one of the great joys of for you know whoever the the next lead pastor is, is, is there's a vibrant congregation and, and, a, and a staff and healthy structures and, and healthy, <laughs> I mean, look at this. We, we're in an adult education class with them. I, I can't even count how many right off the, the bat off the screen, but and, and the work we were doing um, it's the era. with the Jamar Tisby stuff. And I mean, I just, it, it's, 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 you know, there's a vitality here that uh, I think bodes well for the life of this congregation for many, 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 many years um, to come, which is, which is exciting. Well, I'm, a, I'm aware of our time. Any, any other thoughts or comments for the good of the cause? I'm, I'm so grateful that, that, you know, you all immediately got it in terms of why would congregational vitality <laughs> be a, primary emphases along with dismantling structural racism and eradicating, you know, poverty, um, systemic poverty that congregation of Vitality, and you guys get it. Um, and uh, you know, makes perfect sense. Not just because mainline congregations are drying up, but but because it's as we think, you know, we're you know, some of the heart and soul of of the work needing to be done in the world is going to be formed. It's not the only place, but it's certainly one of the places uh, where that's being thought about, talked about, and cared about. So, okay. okay. Blessings. Thank you. Thank you, Have a Can wonderful week. Next week is, um, uh, who's teaching next week? I forget. Jenny. Jenny. Jenny, thank yeah. you. Jenny, teach us next week, and it's on.
uh, structural racism, preaching and teaching, and then um, eradicating poverty the third week. And Jenny will be preaching and Anne will be teaching. And John's not teaching because he has to lead the band at 11 o'clock. <laughs> he can't rely on any two faces at once. Except for the third Sunday in the series, when John's going to be on vacation and Pastor Don is going to be leading the band for the first time in two and a half years. So I'm having to <laughs> make sure Speaking my of congregational my Yeah, right. So make sure my shoulder still functions and my, I can strum a guitar. And, no, it functions again. Anyway. <laughs> Blessings all. Great to be with you. God bless. Bye. Bye. Thank you too. Thank you.